hospital waiting lists, the longest since records began. The COVID backlog means almost 5 million people are yet to start treatment in England, leaving many waiting in pain. It's quite a struggle, to be honest with you. Um, not particularly, obviously, with the symptoms and everything else that I go through, but mentally as well, just not knowing when the surgery is going to be. Also this lunchtime, the Prime Minister says he's anxious about the Indian COVID variant. So could its spread affect the easing of restrictions here? Plus how this singer has faced social media abuse for simply posting a picture of his baby boy. He shares the impact it's had on his mental health. And the Wonder Girl, who's raised tens of thousands for charity, now the star of a superhero book about her dreams. So I don't like my muscular dystrophy. And when I just go to sleep, it all changes because I can just dream whatever I like. This is the ITV Lunchtime News with Kylie Pentelow. Good afternoon. More people are waiting to start hospital treatment in England than ever before, with hospitals facing a huge backlog brought on by the pandemic. Nearly five million people are now on the waiting list, the highest number on record. NHS England is investing £160 million to try to tackle the problem, but that's little comfort for those who've been waiting months for treatment. Our political correspondent Daniel Hewitt reports. When COVID began filling up hospital wards last year, so too did NHS waiting lists for everything else. Prioritising the pandemic meant cancelling treatment for millions, causing a record-breaking backlog and considerable pain for those in it. It would just be nice to know a rough estimate of when the surgery is going to be. Amy has endometriosis, a condition that affects one in 10 women and can cause heavy periods, infertility and debilitating pain. Amy is in constant pain. She needs an operation, but she's already waited six months and has been told it could be a further six until she gets it. It's quite a struggle, to be honest with you. Um, not just physically, obviously, with the symptoms and everything else that I go through, but mentally as well, just not knowing when the surgery is going to be. Um, and obviously it's a worry thinking that the condition's going to get worse uh, the longer I wait. The figures are frankly staggering. In March 2020, 3,097 people were waiting for more than a year to start hospital treatment in England. In March this year, that figure now stands at 436,127. In total, nearly 5 million people were waiting to start treatment at the end of March, the highest number since records began 14 years ago. There's no question that the uh, NHS now face, uh, faces a, a huge backlog. Uh, it's a massive national challenge, but I also know we've got a, a, a great, great national institution that's proved itself capable of rising to the most phenomenal challenges. So we'll start with your vision check first, then we'll check your pressure. The government has begun with a £160 million scheme to reduce waiting lists, including here at Moorfields Hospital in London, where office spaces are being turned into treatment centres to cut diagnosis for conditions like glaucoma from four hours to 40 minutes. Labour, though, says much more will be needed. These are problems that have been brewing for a number of years under Conservative governments and, of course, merely badly exacerbated by the pandemic so it's good that the NHS wants to put in place a plan to try and address this backlog of waiting times but it's a really serious situation and one that we should never have found ourselves going into a pandemic. The pandemic may right now be in retreat but the momentous task of dealing with the damage left in its wake is only just beginning. Daniel Hewitt, ITV News. Well, joining me now to talk more about this is Wendy Preston, Head of Nursing Practice at the Royal College of Nursing. Thank you very much for joining me, Wendy. First off, uh, the longest waiting list since records began. That must be a huge concern to you. It is. And the examples that we've just heard um, and, and the figures that we've just had explained shows why this funding, but not just the funding, actual action to back that up is required now to support the NHS and the wider social care to recovery. Nurses see the impact uh, for their patients and family on a daily basis, and it's very difficult. And, and that's why we need action now. Funding is not just about extra beds, extra equipment. 
it's about the workforce and nursing is the largest workforce. Mm, and of course, some people might have become um, more unwell while they've been waiting for their surgery or a procedure. Could that mean that has a knock on effect and they might need, need more treatment in the future? Um, it, it, it could do, unfortunately, um, the complexities of, of delays and looking at uh, all of the various different um, pathways uh, that have got delays. They're very complex. They need specialist nursing and uh, any delay. Um, you know, whilst we've heard is so frustrating, um, needs to, uh, may lead to more complex care. Um, and for that, we need to ensure that we've got the nursing workforce that we need to deliver that. Mm. And you mentioned the investment there, the 160 million, uh, things like extra clinics at weekend, virtual assessment. So what more would you like to see done? Okay. Well, extra clinics at the weekend and, um, it is great. However, if that's been delivered with the same workforce, um, the same workforce that have worked throughout the pandemic, often been redeployed to other areas, you know, they've spent the last 18 months innovating, changing and ensuring that they deliver care. Um, they're tired and they need support. And uh, there could be an expectation that they then work, you know, extra hours to deliver these um, weekend clinics. So it's important that uh, we have uh, investment now in the workforce that we require. And as a professional body for nursing, we've launched some uh, nursing workforce standards this week. So we've set out what the standard is. We absolutely now need action by government to uh, ensure the workforce is there to deliver those standards. OK, we'll have to leave it there. Wendy Preston, thank you very much. Thank you. Next this lunchtime, the Prime Minister admitted today he is anxious about the spread of the Indian variant of COVID here in the UK. A rising number of cases have been discovered here. And Boris Johnson said he wouldn't rule anything out as government scientists discuss how to keep it under control. For more on this, our science editor Tom Clark has joined me. Um, is this likely to derail us from those plans to ease us out of the uh, lockdown? Well, it's certainly the question uh, his advisers are asking themselves right now. You remember on Monday at a pre the big press conference about opening up this coming Monday, the government sounded pretty optimistic and cautiously confident too about those wider openings up in, in June. But today, the Prime Minister sounded considerably more subdued when he was asked about this India variant that's on the rise in small parts of the UK. Have a listen. It is a variant of concern. We are uh, anxious about it. It has been spreading. Now, at the moment, there's a very wide uh, you know, range of scientific opinion about uh, what could happen. Uh, there are meetings uh, going on today to consider exactly what uh, we need to do. Uh, there's a range of, of things that we could do. We're, we're, we're ruling nothing out. Now, that division in scientific opinion he was talking about is, on one hand, you've got some scientists who are thinking, perhaps more hoping, that the rise in new variant Indian cases we've seen are because of a rush of people coming over after India was added and its neighbouring countries added to the red list in the end of April. And it doesn't look like it's the variant that's going to give us any problems with the vaccine. So maybe we shouldn't be too concerned. On the other hand, you've got scientists saying there's some pretty good evidence now this variant might be more transmissible than the UK variant. And if it spreads quickly enough through the population, there's enough people unvaccinated out there. It could cause a rise in cases, possibly uh, even hospitalizations. We hope not too many deaths because of the vaccination program, but it's really one to watch. We really have to wait and see, though, the coming weeks, how does this play out? And that's really what the scientists will be looking for. Tom, thank you very much. The man accused of murdering PCSO Julia James in Kent will go on trial in November. 21-year-old Callum Wheeler appeared in court this morning. Sangeeta Lau was at the hearing in Maidstone. Sangeeta, what was said today? Well, Callum Wheeler only spoke today to confirm his name. He wasn't here in person, but joined by video link. So we were able to see him on a screen from inside the court. He was wearing a grey T-shirt, grey trousers and a black face mask. Now, this is the first hearing, which basically means lawyers are discussing trial dates. But what they did say was that a number of forensic tests are being carried out at the moment on several items, including an iron bar. Now, it's just over two weeks since PCSO Julia James's body was found in Woodland near Canterbury after she'd been walking her dog. A post-mortem examination 
found she suffered serious head injuries in an attack which today lawyers described as extremely violent and completely random. Now, since then, police have been searching the area. They are still appealing for anyone with information to come forward. While they do that, Mr Wheeler has been remanded in custody and is likely to stand trial later this year in November. Sangeet Lal, thank you. Days of violence between Israeli forces and Palestinian militants has worsened overnight. It's now thought more than 70 people, including 17 children, have been killed since Monday as rocket attacks and airstrikes intensify. The escalation of the fighting over the past few days has prompted warnings of a full-scale war. Lucy Watson has the latest. It is a conflict accelerating at frightening speed. With Gaza's night sky ablaze, Israel pushes ahead with its intense bombardment. And it is one barrage of rockets after another sent back by Hamas, more than 1,500 of them in just three days. The Israeli army took aim at this building, believing it was Hamas offices. It was the home of the Sequala family. People were shouting in the streets, telling us to leave. The apartment next to us was about to be bombed. We just left everything and ran. There is little left of their life now. I was in the house when the bombs fell. I told my mum I can feel the explosion in my stomach. I was so scared. These are ordinary people bearing the brunt. Israel maintains they are targeted attacks on militants. Yet these bodies are those of two cousins, 11 and 13, innocent children killed as an airstrike hit their home. The assaults are fierce and relentless on both sides. And as plumes of smoke rise, so too do the death tolls. Gaza's stands at more than 65. Israel's is at seven. With tempers fraying, intercommunal fighting within Israel has also engulfed its streets. This Arab taxi driver was attacked by Jews last night, prompting pleas from Israel's Prime Minister for it to stop. To the citizens of Israel, I do not care if your blood is boiling. You cannot take the law into your own hands. You cannot come and take an ordinary Arab citizen and try to lynch him, just as we cannot watch Arab citizens doing this to Jewish citizens. This will not happen. But words and warnings are doing little to quell the flames, with neither side showing signs of backing down. Lucy Watson, ITV News. Still to come, the Champions League final is heading to Portugal. We'll have details on how many fans will be allowed to go. Plus, the amazing story of this mini Wonder Woman and the book penned by her mum. Next, as the government confirmed plans this week to further relax restrictions, the long-term impact of the pandemic, particularly on our mental health, is yet to unfold. A survey commissioned by Public Health England as part of Mental Health Awareness Week has found more than half of us have been worried about the well-being of our friends and family in the last year. Well, joining me to discuss his own recent struggles with mental health is singer Jake Quickenden and Claire Perkins from Public Health England. Thanks very much to both of you for joining me this lunchtime. Uh, Jake, you've talked about the death of your father and your brother and how you've had anxiety and panic attacks in the past. Can you just describe how it affects you? Yeah, it just it stops me from doing certain things that usually I would be able to do. Um, and it's unfortunate, like this day and age, that it's, it's not spoken about as much as it should, um, especially for the younger generation. We need to know that it is OK to talk about these things and it is OK to kind of keep connected and uh, talk to the people closest to us about the way we're feeling and not to be ashamed of it. Yeah, and you're very open on social media about your mental well-being, but you've also received a lot of abuse on there too. You've recently had a baby boy, baby Leo, um, but you've even suffered abuse when you posted pictures of him. How did that make you feel? Yeah, obviously, you can never really get your head around being trolled over having your new baby. Um, and... In the past, and even recently, I argue back and I bite back at these trolls and stuff. Um, but I'm trying to make a conscious decision now to kind of not fuel the fire and, and, and not argue back. Because at the end of the day, sometimes all we need is a nice comment or, uh, or an arm around us and a hug. 
Um, and I think the people that kind of do hate online, they're the people that maybe do need a helping hand and, and, uh, and a bit of a talk. So I'm trying more now to just ignore it or even offer any help or support and just say, if you need a chat, then I can chat about it rather than kind of hating online. Mm, it's very generous of you. Um, do, do you think coronavirus and lockdown has been tough for people who may be struggling with their mental health? I think it's been much harder to connect with the people closest to us because we have been so stuck in. And and like you said, the research by Thoughtful showed that over half of us have really been worried about our friends and family's mental health in the lockdown. Um, and it's been hard to kind of be able to gauge because usually you get asked if you're OK. The first thing you said is, yeah, I'm fine. Um, and you can't actually see mental health. That's the thing. Every Anyone can be suffering, but we can't actually see it. So it's, it has been a lot harder to kind of connect and talk about it when we've not been able to see each other in person. Yeah, and Claire, coming to you, it has been a difficult time for many, hasn't it? Yes. Yes, it definitely has. As you say, 50% of um, people report that they have struggled um, and their mental health has definitely been impacted by the pandemic. But firstly, to say that, you know, feeling more anxious um, and um, is, is, a, is a normal response to a pandemic. And um, it's, it's most likely that the majority of people will bounce back um, after lockdown and we go back into a more normal way of life to um, the levels of mental health and wellbeing they had um, prior to the pandemic um, but there will be people who will continue to, to, to struggle and, and that's why in Public Health England we've developed some resources some, um, some tips on how people can, um, can look after themselves um, their own mental health and that of others um, and at the centre of our Every Mind Matter resources is an NHS approved mind plan um, and it's five simple really easy questions um, just about um, stress and worries and mood and how how people are sleeping and once you complete the five questions it gives you a personalized act action plan um, which can uh, which gives you some really good resources to, to help yourselves and those th those around you and to date we've had over the last 18 months we've had over 3.2 million people in this country that have um, that have completed a plan and and hopefully that's been really helpful um, to them in in trying to um, improve their own mental well-being. Mm, really good advice. OK, Claire and Jake, thank you very much for speaking to me. Thank you. Thank you very much. And if you feel you're struggling with your own mental health, there is some information on how you can get help. It's all on the ITB News website. Former Prime Minister David Cameron is to be questioned by MPs this afternoon over his lobbying for Greensill Capital. Mr Cameron is appearing at back-to-back -back hearings by two House of Commons committees. Texts and emails from Mr Cameron were published this week, showing contact he had with several ministers. He denies breaking any rules. The UK competition watchdog has told package holiday companies they must be ready to refund holiday makers if trips are cancelled because of the pandemic this summer. The Competition and Markets Authority received more than 23,000 complaints from customers last year. Now, Chelsea and Manchester City fans will be able to attend the Champions League final at the end of the month. It's been confirmed today the game will take place in the city of Porto in Portugal rather than the original venue of Istanbul. Well, our reporter Jonathan Brown joins me now for more on this. Jonathan, presumably very good news for fans. Yes, well, with only 16 days left until the Champions League final, this announcement hasn't left much time for fans to plan ahead. But today, UEFA, European football's governing body, has confirmed that a total of 12,000 tickets will be made available to Manchester City and Chelsea fans. The game itself will take place in Porto, as you said, on May the 29th. But this all stems back to the fact that that game was supposed to take place in Istanbul in Turkey. But high COVID rates there led the UK government to put the country on its red list, which meant that people weren't supposed to travel there for anything like leisure purposes, for example. Um, government officials then said that they wanted the game to be moved to Wembley because it's an all England tie, of course, but they wouldn't allow UEFA guests like broadcasters or sponsors to travel here without having to quarantine when they arrive. Now, Portugal seems like a compromise. It's on the UK government's green list from this coming Monday. Um, and also that means that people can travel there quarantine free. But the hardest part for people, I imagine, will probably getting hold of those tickets, which clubs are yet to allocate. Oh, yeah, I'm sure they will be like gold dust. OK, Jonathan, thank you very much. 
And finally, for this lunchtime, she's known as Wonder Girl after raising tens of thousands of pounds for charity, walking every day for a month dressed as Wonder Woman. Well, now, seven-year-old Carmela Chillery Watson, who has muscular dystrophy, has been turned into a real superhero for a children's book. And as Faye Barker now reports, she is pretty delighted with the outcome. Switch your nose, hold my hands, and away we go. Every superhero Yay. needs a sidekick. Look how there's a hagfish coming. For Wonder Girl Carmella, it's and her Carmella dog, Tinker, Girl. nicknamed well, the Stinker. The super pair are now the subject of a super book all about the adventures seven year old Carmella dreams of. I can just dream whatever I like and I can just dream I have wings and powers or be a unicorn or a fairy. So that just, so I'm, I, I exci I'm excited when I just go to sleep. You can't give us all that, that's too okay. generous. In waking hours, Carmela is equally as extraordinary. She has muscular dystrophy and last autumn raised 50,000 pounds for charity in her Wonder Woman walk. Her efforts even caught the attention of actress Gal Gadot, who plays the superhero in the latest films. The actress said Carmela was a true hero, inspiring and strong. As the star of her own book, a dream has turned to reality, and it was written by her mum. I thought it was a nice thing to give back to Carmela for all the effort that she does playing the disability advocate and the wonder girl that she actually is in real life. Carmela is determined her condition won't prevent her from leading as active a life as she can. And if she ever needs a little lift, her four-footed friend is always at her side. She's my um, best friend that keeps me happy. Faye Barker, ITV News. <laughs> Very cute. Well, that's it for this lunchtime. Mary will be here with the ITV Evening News at 6.30. The news where you are follows the national weather. But from all of us here, have a lovely afternoon. Bye-bye.